Okay, hello. I am here to talk to you a bit about neuroscience. So I just had a great introduction, but here's some photos of me as a teacher. And then I get to work with some really fabulous neuropsychologists at the Kennedy Krieger Institute, which is a lot of fun. So I don't know if you guys knew it, but this week is actually Brain Week which is really exciting and happened to fall on the same week. And Brain Week is a brain awareness week for uh, the global campaign to increase public awareness of the progress and benefits of brain research. So that's pretty exciting because I'm here to talk to you about brains. So neuroscience has given us a lot of tools for understanding more about our students. And it's been really exciting. And I think a lot of you have been influenced by a lot of this. We learned more about affect and learning. We've learned more about how memory works, um, the importance of sleep and how sleep changes over time for our students. Uh, we learned more about neurodiversity, which is what is the building blocks of UDL. We've learned about processing and the importance of attention and how attention functions. And those are all really exciting, phenomenal things that we now know about our learners that can help us to educate them better. Okay, and I love neuroscience and education. I am fortunate enough that my full-time job is connecting the two, um, but I wanna let you know about a threat that has to do with our UDL community and neuroscience. And that is that there is a brain-hungry virus, and you are all most at risk. I'm very sorry. Just look to the person next to you, to your left. Look to your right. One of you may be infected. Just letting you know. Odds are high. Um, and this is neuromyth mania. Okay? There is a, a virus, and we need to talk about this. It's very serious. So the symptoms of neuromyth mania may include but are not limited to compulsively clicking on links with the word brain or the prefix neuro. It's okay if you do this. I do it sometimes too. Applying neuromyths to instructional decision making. I am also guilty of having done this in the past. Haphazardly purchasing dubious brain-based products. Using illegitimate brain-based products for teaching in the classroom applying the term brain-based to anything related to learning or education because we figure that's where it happens in the brain and so we can just call it that. And abandoning critical thinking skills in the presence of an fMRI image. And I know most of you have experienced that. And you're like, oh, brain, it's very exciting. <laughs> okay, so the number one risk factor of being an educator who has neuromyth mania happens to be having some understanding of the brain. And this has been um, researched by a few different researchers. There's actually ongoing research right now um, at American University to figure out just how this is happening and what's going on. But what it appears to be is that there, you get like a gateway drug. You learn a little bit about the brain and you get very, very excited. And then you know just enough to make some of the neuromyths out there seem very plausible. And so since you're so excited, and we've told you wonderful things about the brain and learning, um, you tend to start to believe things that maybe aren't true or half true. You start purchasing things that you didn't need to purchase, spending your own money, because that's what teachers do. Um, and really looking at resources that are dubious in nature. So it's not just teachers. Everyone is really excited about neuroscience. This is a picture from a courtroom. Um, the courts have been using neuroscience and they're using those fMRI images and brain scans. And it's actually caused some concern because we know about neurodiversity, right? Everyone here knows about how our brains are not all the same. Well, you can't put a, a, a suspect in a scanner show them pictures of someone that they supposedly harmed and then say, look, that part of the brain that recognizes fear or threat or anger is what's activated because that part of the brain might be in a slightly different place for every individual, right? So it's not just educators. Everyone is really excited about neuroscience and maybe expanding it a little too far. We're not quite at the point where we can put someone in a scanner and know exactly what's going on inside their particular head. Right, so we need to be a little bit more cautious. Right, and so this is a lesson from a dead salmon. Um, some really funny researchers 
And I always enjoy people that can mix humor with science. Um, they wanted to test if some of the algorithms they had been using for fMRI studies um, were credible. And so they had been studying human subjects. They were putting them in the scanner, showing them a bunch of human faces, so like happy face, frowny face, and asking them to look at it and think about what emotion they were, being, they were seeing, and then they were getting all these scans. So they wanted to know if this is actually working. And one of them went to a fish market and purchased a large dead salmon. And they put the large dead salmon in the scanner and showed them all the same faces because it's science and you need to replicate exactly what you did. So this salmon was given the same directions. Please look at this face and think about what emotion you are seeing. Um, and when they went through all of the um, information, what they found was that, you know, we sometimes say something lit up, was that the salmon's brain um, seemed to light up. Now, an fMRI image is not actually lighting up. That's just saying where there was activity within the brain. And what they discovered was that if you weren't really, really careful with your numbers, the movement of the machine itself could cause movement within the brain, and it would make it look like there was action. Because I'm going to put like a leap of faith out there that the dead salmon was not actually taking in the facial expressions. But maybe, I mean, you know, we didn't disprove it. So, um, so just caution that not every neuroimaging study is necessarily a good neuroimaging study. And it's still a new field, and so the kinks are still being worked out. Now, neuroimaging tells us phenomenal things about humans. It's, they've told us so many things about students, especially kids, because we can't really do a lot of invasive stuff with kids. And so it's a really, really powerful tool. But just because someone shows you a neuroimaging image, um, just don't believe it at face value that it's, that it's something good. Okay, so I did tell you that some of us believe in neuromyths, and that's really common, and I told you to look at your left and you look to your right, and someone's infected, right? And some of them seem pretty innocuous, and they don't seem like it's that bad, and what's the problem if, if I believe a few inaccurate things about the brain? It doesn't really seem like it's that big a deal. So I want to show you something that I saw on Facebook recently. How many of you took this quiz? The left brain, right brain quiz. I know some of you did. You really, that looks like fun. No, it was really fun. I took it. Uh, apparently, I'm 60% right brained, which makes sense because math and I don't always get along. It reinforced a lot of my, my self-concept, both positive and negative, and had face validity because it seemed like it represented me, right? Well, left brain and right brain is a myth. We use our whole brain. There are very few people who have only one hemisphere of their brain, and that's because of really serious disorders. But most of us in this room, I'm going to assume, have both sides of our brain, and that we're using both sides continually and together. And they both have different things that they're doing, but they're working in a partnership, and they're always working together, right? So it seems like not that big a deal. It's fun. It's funny. Maybe we've had our students do this. Some of us have had students decide if they're left brain or right brain. I know I've been in schools where students have decorated brains to show which side of the brain they are. Um, and it seems fun. But there's a problem when we talk about left brain versus right brain. Also, the 10% of the brain thing is a myth, too. You all use more than 10% of your brain. Way to go. Thanks a lot, Morgan Freeman, for telling us lies. <laughs> so the danger of this particular neuromyth is that if I am right-brained, then I'm inherently weak in my left side. And I can never be good at math because someone just told me I'm hardwired to be a certain way, to have a certain weakness, and I'm trapped, and I can't move out of that. I'm just bad at math. I will be bad at math. My brain is weak or small or something on that side, and I can't get away from it. Right? And that's the problem with that neuromyth and some of the other neuromyths, that it's the exact opposite of what we want to tell our students about themselves. And what I think is really interesting about this neuromyth is that it goes against one of the most beautiful things, I think, that we know about the brain because of neuroscience. And that has to do with neuroplasticity. How many of you heard the word neuroplasticity before? So neuroplasticity is this amazing thing that means our brain 
reshapes itself. It makes new connections. It goes around damaged areas. It finds new ways of learning and new pathways, and it strengthens things. And what fires together, wires together, and so we develop new skills. So if you're going to tell your students something about the brain, instead of telling them their left brain or their right brain, wouldn't it be so much more powerful to tell them about the real science, which is neuroplasticity exists, and that we are beautiful beings, that we can overcome challenges, and that we can become someone new, and now I'm filled with hope, I'm filled with potential, and I'm filled with possibility, right? So there are some ways to treat and prevent neuromythmania, and since we've already realized that many of us are infected, we should probably pay close attention. That is your why of learning. All right, so the first thing we should do is provide educators with vetted and reliable sources about neuroscience information. Because again, it's so exciting and wonderful, and we should be exploring this. And so I've put up just a few sources that have been creating materials for teachers. Brainfacts.org, the Data Foundation, Annenberg Learner has a wonderful free uh, open online course. Um, and then Genes to Cognition from the Cold Spring Harbor DNA Lab has this really great interactive tool for learning about the different parts of the brain. We should encourage interdisciplinary work and conversations in the areas of mind, brain, and education science. And we should include practicing educators. That researchers should be talking to educators to answer the questions that you have to make your practice better. And so for anyone who is in this room with the researcher tag, you should go find a teacher. And if you're a teacher in the room, you should go find a researcher tag person and go have a conversation with them about what they're doing and what you're doing. We need to connect the I with the R, right? Because we're the IRN. Encourage educators to think critically about brain-based products. Just because it has a brain on it doesn't mean it's good. Um, make citation of neuroscience studies and images a common practice among UDL facilitators, coaches, and presenters. So for example, this is a beautiful picture of some brains. I do not know what it came from. I found it on Google Images. I have no idea what it means. Um, and some of us are using these pictures, and we do know, we know what they mean, and we know where they're from, but we need to tell the people that we're talking to so that you can look it up yourself. There's no other professional community in which not citing your sources would be acceptable in a conference. And so we should be doing the same thing. So the last piece is that when it comes to neuroscience and education, we have to be expert learners. We talk about expert learners all the time. We need to be purposeful and motivated. We need to be strategic and goal-directed. And we need to be knowledgeable and resourceful. And so what we really need to do is balance our enthusiasm for learning about the brain and what it can tell us about our students and how it can inform our practice and make us extraordinary educators with our critical thinking skills. We would never encourage our students to just lob onto an idea or information without being critical about it. And that's what we need to do as UDL practitioners when it comes to the attractiveness of neuroscience. So as a UDL community, we need to learn and explore neuroscience because, as Kid President says, together we can be more awesome. Thank you.